to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ Jesus said in Luke 15, 10, Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. We welcome you today to our study of the Gospel of Luke. Today we're finishing out this study in Luke by looking at the last half of the book of Luke and the powerful teachings that Jesus gives. And so we're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. If you don't have your Bible out and ready, we want to encourage you to locate your Bible, get it ready, find it, and we're going to look to the Word of God in our study today. As always, today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship service. You'll find people there who love God, who are concerned about the truth, and who would be happy to sit down and discuss the scriptures with you. And so please visit the Church of Christ in your local area. Also, we want to encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our Bible study materials. We have audio lessons, video lessons, transcripts, study questions. We have lessons on every book of the Old and New Testament, as well as a wide variety of topical studies, and they're all available to you free of charge. If you need a hard copy, you can fill out our media request form, and from that we can either send you a digital download instantaneously if you select that, or if you'd like to have a DVD or a CD, we'll mail that to you free of charge as well. And friend, won't you check out our website and make sure that you visit around and see all the good utilities we've got there, all the good tools we've got for Bible study. Also, please visit your respective uh, app store for Apple and for Android. We have an app that is great to use in the fast-paced world in which we live in. Good way to study the Bible from your smartphone, and we want to encourage you to check that out as well. In this lesson, we're going to be finishing out the book of Luke. And as you remember, Luke is about Jesus as the ideal person. Luke chapter 2, verse 52, Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, favor with God, and favor with man. Intellectually, physically, socially, and spiritually. Jesus is that ideal or perfect person. And in Luke 15, where we're starting today, Jesus teaches us the value of every individual, every person is important to God, and God doesn't want one person to be lost. Luke 15, we've got the, the lost things. You've got the story of the lost coin, you've got the story of the, the lost sheep, and you've got the story of the two lost sons, that lost coin that the woman loses. She sweeps up the whole house, she searches diligently until she finds it, and there's great rejoicing. The lost sheep, the, the shepherd, leaves the ninety and nine that are safe, goes out searching for that one lost sheep, and when he finds it, there's great rejoicing. And then the lost son, who was the prodigal son, and the lost brother, who thought he was better than everybody else, and especially better than the other brother, when the, the idea is when they came, when that lost son came home, the father was joyous over that. Listen to Luke 15. Verse number 7 and verse number 10. There is more rejoicing over the, in, uh, among the angels of God over one sinner who repents than 99 who need no repentance. When, when one person comes back, the value of every soul is seen here. When a person comes back to God, what great rejoicing there ought to be. You know, sometimes when people repent and turn their life around, we, if we're not careful, we can look down on that. We can say, well, 
I've been like the, like the older brother. I've been here the whole time. I've been faithful the whole time and nobody's ever got excited over that. This prodigal, this wayward comes home and everybody wants to throw a party as it were. But friend, we need to realize that person was lost. We need to realize the state they were in and we like the angels of heaven need to rejoice over the value of one soul. Jesus died so that that person could go to heaven. When they get their life right, they come out of prodigal living, they return to the flock. We ought to, like the Father with open arms, receive them back with great joy because their soul has been saved. And you see, part of the problem is, sometimes we don't really think about what it means to be lost. Let's illustrate that in the next chapter in Luke 16. I want you to see what it really means to be lost. Would you look in your Bible in Luke chapter 16, and I want you to here see the story of Lazarus and the rich man, and this is the state, spiritually speaking, that that lost son was in before he came back to God. Look in Luke 16, beginning in verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now watch this. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember, in your lifetime you received the good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. And there's a lot more details that are mentioned in that story, but I want you to hear the state of this rich man. On this side, the tables were kind of turned. The rich man had it all, Lazarus the poor beggar, he just got the crumbs that fell from the table in essence. But on the other side, it was a lot different. The rich man, he wakes up in torment. Father Abraham, have mercy on me. I'm tormented in this flame. Send Lazarus. I just want one drop of water in these flames. There's our awful torment and pain and agony. And of course he says, son, remember, there was agony, there was pain, there was torment, there was fire, there was a remembrance of the things you had and should have done, all of those things make that place torment a horrible place. Friend, when we talk about somebody returning, we're talking about somebody escaping that fire. We're talking about somebody being plucked out of the torment that they are headed down the road toward. Would anybody want to, uh, of their own decision, walk into a burning building? suffer torment and agony and pain and, and separation. No, nobody wants that. And yet people who are walking down the wrong path, the wide path that leads to destruction, that's the end result of that life. And so when we talk about the rejoicing, that's why. Because a soul has been saved from eternal destruction and eternal demise, and we ought to be happy and joyous over that. Now, in that same vein, like the older brother who got upset because he had always been in the father's house and nobody ever threw a party for him. Let's not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Let's not think that because we're God's servants, we're better than other people. Luke 17 tells us how we ought to think. Look in your Bible in Luke chapter 17, verse number 10. What ought to be our attitude? So likewise you, when you've done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We've only done that, which is our duty to do. Friend, just because we're faithful to God, just because we strive to walk in the light and we're in the house of God, as it were, that doesn't mean that we're high and mighty and better than everybody else. That, that's the way the, the Pharisees and the chief priests and the scribes, that's the way they looked at it. And Jesus often said to them, hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about these people saying, they draw near with their mouth, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. 
If I really have the attitude God wants me to have, it'll be an attitude of humility. Do you remember Luke 14, 11? Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. Friend, I, I need to realize, even when I have done my best, even when I have done everything God asked me to do, because of sin, I'm an unprofitable servant. I've only done that which is my duty. If I'm going to be saved, it'll be by the grace of God. Ephesians 2 verse 8. I haven't earned it. I haven't merited it. I don't deserve it. I don't have my own righteousness. I'm a sinner in need of God's grace and God's mercy. And I need to realize I'm no better than anybody else. I want to help others and do good to the best that I can. And with that mindset, with an attitude of realizing that, shouldn't we also be thankful? I want you to look at Luke 17, 17, and here's the story. Ten lepers come to Jesus requesting to be healed. Uh, Jesus heals them. And as they all leave, one of them on the way, he stops and he thinks about it and he comes back and he gives thanks to God. And I want you to see the question Jesus asked. It's a haunting question in Luke 17, verse 17. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? When Jesus thought about all these people been healed, and he thought about nine out of ten just kind of took that healing and went on their, on their own way. Only one man stopped to come back and give God praise and thanks. Friend, that reminds us that all of us, if you're a child of God, put yourself in the place of that leper. You were separated from God. You were sick with sin. By God's mercy and by God's grace, you've been brought out of that. Ephesians 2 verse 4, You He made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins. How thankful we ought to be for all that God has done for us. Do we just kind of take that and go on our way and live our life and do what we want to do? Or do we really have the thankfulness to come back and say, thank you? What do I need to, do, do, to show my thanks? How do I need to live my life in view of what God has done for me and what does a life full of thanksgiving look like? And friend, that's a life of commitment. That's a life of service. That's a life of giving yourself to God in every way. And then, of course, in Luke 18, 1, Jesus reminds us of the power of prayer. Men ought always to pray and never lose heart. When you get discouraged, when life gets you down, when you face troubles and difficulties, when life throws you a curveball, men ought always to pray and never lose heart. Let's be honest today. Everybody from time to time gets discouraged. Everybody from time to time may get a little down or a little depressed. How do you deal with that? I'm not saying this is the only way, but when life doesn't go exactly like you want, what do you do? First thing you ought to do is pray. Jesus spoke a parable to them saying, men ought always to pray and not lose heart. In prayer, I approach the throne of God, Hebrews 4, 16. In prayer, God can help me to overcome that. In prayer, I've given my problems to God and God cares, 1 Peter 5, verse 17. In prayer, we receive strength and comfort as Jesus did in the garden in Matthew 26. And so instead of letting the problems and the weight of this world and the difficulties crush you, turn it over to God in prayer. Let God help you with the problems and the things that we deal with. And then we have that story in Luke 18, which we referenced earlier in our lesson. But I want you to see how Jesus contrast this pious man with the humble man. Look in Luke 18. I want you to begin reading in verse number 10. The Bible says, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I have given tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, 
would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. Can you imagine the audacity of this Pharisee? God, here, listen to his prayer now. Can you imagine you put your hands together, you bow your head and you say, God, thank you that you didn't make me bad like everybody else. Extortioners, unjust, I'm glad I'm not an adulterer, and Lord, I'm really glad I'm not like this guy right here, this tax collector. In fact, I'm a pretty good guy. I fast, I pray, I give, look at all I do. Aren't you glad? I'm glad I'm not, you didn't make me like him, thank you for that, and aren't you glad I'm good? And then the tax collector wouldn't even so much as approach it, wouldn't even raise his head. He just, he just beat his breast and he said, I don't know what to say. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. One man thought he was it. One man knew he wasn't. One man thought God ought to be thankful for him. One man was thankful for God. What's our attitude today? Regardless of, of how much you may know, regardless of what you may be, do we realize the attitude of humility we need? Do we realize how much we need God? God Listen, all of us are sinners. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. There's none righteous of their self, no, not one. Romans 3, verse 10. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. Even the most righteous among us face it. There's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin. Ecclesiastes 7, verse number 26. And the soul who sins shall surely die. Regardless of what I may think I am, boil it all down to its basics. God be merciful to me, a sinner. I need the attitude, I need the heart, and I need the mindset of this public or tax collector. I'm just a sinner in need of the grace and mercy of God. Without God, I'm nothing. You may think you're something. You may think you're important. You may think you're the best player on God's team. But in reality, without God, you're nothing. God be merciful to me. Without the blood and the sacrifice and the gift of Jesus, there's no hope. No hope for me, no hope for you. And so let's not get too high and mighty thinking about ourselves when in reality, we're all just sinners in need of God's grace and God's mercy. But here's the good news. That's why Jesus came. The publican who said, God be merciful to me, a sinner, that's the person Jesus came to save. How do I know that? Look in your Bible in Luke chapter 19. I want you to look in Luke chapter 19 at what is said about our Lord and Savior. Verses 9 and 10 records this. Talking to Lazarus, the Bible says, And Jesus said to Lazarus, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Why did Jesus come to the world? Why why did he die? Why did he live a perfect life? Why did he die that death? He came to save people, people like me and you who are lost in sin. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. I'm lost, you're lost. He came to save us, and thus we ought to be thankful for all that Jesus did for us. Now, in about Luke chapter 20 through 24, we're going to be entering in very quickly to the last few days in the life of Jesus. Jesus has been working miracles. He's been teaching. He has often, very openly and publicly, rebuked the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. They are now at a point where they can't take it anymore. Jesus is growing in authority and power. Theirs is diminishing, and so they only have two options. Either submit to Jesus and recognize He's the Son of God or kill Him. Sadly, they choose the latter. And in Luke chapter 20, verse 20, the Bible says they kept a close watch on him. They even sent spies who pretend to be honest, hoping to catch Jesus in something he said so that might, they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. Jesus has blistered them too many times with the scriptures and with their own hypocrisy. And so now 
They're trying to catch Jesus in his words. They can't do that, so they're eventually going to take him and hand him over to the th authorities and the power that be so that they may put him to death. But as they continue to try that and as they continue to question Jesus, we see the, the ability of the master, master teacher in Luke 20. In Luke chapter 20, verse number 40, the Bible says these words, and, but after that, they dared not question Jesus anymore. They tried to trick him. They tried to catch him in his own words. They tried to put him in a biblical conundrum, and they just couldn't do it. They finally give up, and now they're just going to have to make up lies and tell stories on Jesus and eventually convince the Romans that he needs to be put to death. And that's exactly what they do. And so in Luke chapter 21, Jesus will now teach them about the power of just giving ourselves to God and how we need to be ready for when Christ comes. And those same lessons are applicable to us. Luke 21, we've got the story of the widow's two mites. Uh, here you've got this, Jesus is at the temple. He's watching all the people give. Some people put a lot of money. It makes a lot of noise and they expect some kind of recognition for that. And then this poor widow, she comes in, just two mites, clank, clank. That's all she's got. And Jesus said, these gave out of their abundance. She gave out of her poverty. She gave more than everybody. Well, how did she give more than everybody? Because she gave till it hurt. They had plenty to give. They gave, but she didn't have much to give, and she gave it all. Again, emphasizing our need to give all to God and to be ready when the Lord Himself does come. Then in Luke chapter 22, as we enter the last two or three chapters in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 22 Jesus has now been uh, taken. He's going to be taken by the authorities. And in the process of doing that, Simon is going to say, you know, he's pretty bold. Peter will say, you know, even if all are taken, I'll remain with you to the end. And Jesus says, Peter, you just don't really understand what's about to happen. Uh, Simon, Simon, he says in Luke 22, 31, I've prayed for you that your faith would not, Satan's asked to have you. I've prayed for you that your faith would not falter. And the Lord promised to Peter in Luke 22 that when the rooster crows, he'd deny him. And Luke 22, 61 says this, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. After Peter had denied Jesus, and Peter remembered the words of the Lord, how he said to him before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Peter did just that. He denied the Lord. You were one of them, right? No, no, not me. Your speech sounds like it. We think you were with him. Oh, no, no. He began to curse and to swear. I don't even know the man. Can you imagine that? And yet Jesus all along predicted that would happen. He needed Peter to see you've still got some growing. You've still got some maturing to do. You can be useful in the kingdom, but you need to really consider your commitment and what it really means to be a fo follower of Jesus Christ. And then in Luke chapter 23, we have some of the powerful statements of Jesus uh, as he is suffering. Luke 23, 34, you've got Jesus as he is thinking about all that the people have done, the, the beating, the mocking, the spitting on him, uh, nailing him to a cross. Those people who did that were evil people. How did Jesus feel about them? You talk about a man with a good heart. Luke 23, 34, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. So the very people that were putting him on the cross and putting him there to die, Jesus' mindset was that they would one day receive forgiveness and the joy and hope of being a Christian. There were thieves that were also crucified with Jesus. The accounts of the gospel tell us, the gospel accounts tell us at one time they both began to revile Jesus, but evidently one of them had a change of heart. Luke 23, verses 42 through 43, one of them said, uh, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to that man, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. That man changed his heart. That man put his trust and hope in God. Under the old law, the law they're living under, he turned to Jesus and he pleaded with God for forgiveness and mercy. And Jesus chose to do that. This man who didn't have any hope, this man who was a criminal, that society, he reached a point, society just said, there's nothing else we can do, had to put him to death. That man still found hope in Jesus Christ. Friend, as long as we have time and opportunity, 
There's hope to turn our lives to God, to give ourselves to Him, and to see the joy that comes from living a Christian life. Then just a couple more ideas in Luke 24. Jesus has been put to death. He gave up His life on the cross for us, but as the song says, up from the grave He arose. Death could not contain Him. Listen to the words of Luke chapter 24, verse number 1. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they, the women and certain, uh, the men and certain women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. Listen to this, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of men, be crucified, and the third day rise again. Friend, this is the ultimate defeat of Satan and sin and death. Death could no longer contain him. Up from the grave he arose. He is not here. He is risen. Jesus went to the cross. He bore our sins in his own body. 1 Peter 2, 24. He suffered in great agony to the point that they put him to death. And don't you know, the Jews and all his enemies, when they covered the stone in front, when he died and they put that stone in front of the tomb, they said to themselves, well, it's over now. Not even. He's not here. He is risen. Jesus defeated death. He defeated Satan. He overcame sin. And that statement is a powerful truth that men and women today can still do the same. Friend, the hope we have in Jesus is not just in this life. If you'll submit your life to God, if you'll obey the gospel, if you'll become a Christian, friend, you can have the hope one day you can live with God for all eternity. And so, my friend, we're glad you've joined us for our study of the Gospel of Luke. We want to encourage you to join us next time as we think more about the good news of Jesus Christ. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.